Well, hi everyone. I think we'll, we'll get started. This is our Aging Well community practice that we run every couple of months. And what we try to do is try to give a little bit of an update on some of our regional work that's happening across the Northeast and North Cumbria around all things Aging Well and the three big priority areas with NHS England, but wider than that. And then we often have a bit of a theme discussion about something. And today we're going to have a talk about the digital CGA tool that we have built with our health call colleagues. And we're at the very, very start of trying to explore the potential or added value or not of this tool. So we'll probably spend most of the session looking at that. And, and Caroline, she'll introduce her later, has joined us from Health Call, who will take us through a step by step of that tool with a case study. So because there's quite a number of us, maybe if we just put our names and organisations within the chat so people know who you are if we want to start chat. And it's very informal, so please just pop your hand up or jump in if you want us to stop anywhere and go through stuff and things. I know a few people have got to leave at different times, so we're going to run through the agenda and we might change things around slightly because I think Jen Stee is going to jump in a little bit around planning because you might have to get away a bit sooner, but we'll see how we get on. So could you just click on to the next slide, Anne, please? OK, just to remind everyone, we are being recorded, is that right, Anne? Great. Yes, and Dan, yes. Yeah. No problem. What we wanted to quickly do is, oh, I'm getting a lot of updates coming on my slide, is just talk a little bit about the Aging Well funding. Now, this is a pot of money that's coming down via NHS England for the three big priority areas. And if people are not aware of the priority areas from an NHS lens across the Aging Well, one of the lenses is looking at the care home model, and that's the enhanced healthcare and care home model. That's on the back of all of the Vanguard work that was back out in 2016-17. Another priority area is the urgent community response work that's been had we've been at the forefront this year and last year. And the third priority was this model called the anticipatory care model, which is very much looking at sort of trying to identify people before times of crisis to support them, enable them to remain healthy and well at home as long as possible. So there's an allocated bit of money that actually was used to fund those three priorities. And it is fair and to it say that last year, it was heavily focused on the urgent community response work to try and get places to fulfill that model, start thinking about planning for that model and thinking about the workforce implications. So what we did as an Aging Well team, based on the money that was allocated to the region, we tried to say these are interdependent programmes of work and really the success of your urgent community response model will be heavily dependent on your work that you're doing in your care homes, as well as the work that you're going to do to try and support people before they hit crisis. So we came up and asked the, the region and the areas to think about the three priorities for that spend of money and left it in their hands to decide how they wanted to spend it. So that's just setting the scene for the three big priorities and we came up with these principles. So the next slide there, Anne. That's just what I talked about, the three big priorities for the NHS lens of ageing well. And the next slide, Anne. So across our patch, and this is funding that happened towards the end of 20, 2020, each of the four areas across the North East and North Cumbria, which they described as ICPs, Integrated Care Partnerships, South, North, North Cumbria and Central decided to focus on slightly different things. So that's just a summary of where they focused their age and well funding uh, back towards the end of sort of 2020. And one of it was around MDT working, some strength and balance work, 
then finding people with frailty. And all this works currently ongoing. And we, we did get a bit update a few months from them. And there's some of the presentations that they give us. Uh, but the work is still obviously continuing things. So the next slide there. What we did with some of the money as well is, which we'll probably give an update on in the next few slides, is spend some of that money on projects that we know made sense for the whole region. So the three big areas where we've been focusing our attention on is workforce development. And Leslie Bainbridge with her team lead that called the NCOP work, which is well established now and being rolled out and evaluated robustly. And Leslie will give you an update on that. Then we've got the comprehensive joint assessment tool, which we'll, we'll talk about with Caroline and Health Call. And finally, we've been doing a lot of work on sort of metrics and outcomes and thinking about how we bring all that together. So we start to find people and then measure whether we're making a difference for people's and local communities and populations. So that's been the three big areas of, of some regional work that we funded over the last year or so. So next slide. And I'll probably hand over to Jenny here, which is going to give a little bit of an update on the planning guidance of this year coming out. Is that all right, Jen? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Um, so those of you that are in um, sort of NHS or local authorities will be well versed with some of this, but we thought it would be helpful to share some of the thinking and how you might be able to contribute um, to your local plans um, in your local areas. So. This just summarises some of the deadlines that the um, NHS have got to uh, function to over the next few weeks. Um, and although it says the first draft submission um, is due on the, on the 17th of March, the draft submission from an ICS perspective is that all our locality areas, so each of the places, need to have that submission in by the 3rd of March. So not long, really, four weeks. If you click onto the next slide. So... Just wanted to remind people that this is really complex. So ageing well is really complex, covers lots and lots of different areas. And those of you that may have spent a little bit of time reading some of the planning guidance um, will see that there isn't really a defined area around ageing well. It's inferred in lots of different areas, um, which we've tried to capture on this slide here. Um, but actually our purpose is trying to improve um, things for our older population and we've got to chunk it up so the little elephant in the corner is that we all look at it through our different lenses and that's one of the benefits of this community of practice coming together because we all see things slightly differently and have a different viewpoint and um, my most recent kind of analogy is we talk about working in silos and that working in silos is not a good thing um, and actually I'm going to challenge that back a little bit and say actually to get things done Sometimes you do need to work in your little area where you are the expert or you are working with the expertise in that team. But actually, there's got to be that connectivity and we've got to have those um, information um, being shared amongst different teams in different sectors in different organisations for it to really come together to ensure that we are supporting a population that is able to age well um, in the 21st century. Next slide, please. So this is just really to represent that we all see things from our own mountain top. Um, some of us can see things really clearly and everything's beautiful. Other people will see things really, really complex and it's just a real mush, mush, mush of lots of um, things. And what we need to do is to try and have a perspective from all of those different areas, but bring that together so that we can come together collectively um, and really understand things better. And if you click on again, Anne, and that's, what I was just talking about with that silo. So the next few slides are just a summary of some of the key points that have been pulled out of the planning guidance. Um, and the bits in green are where um, we'd like to really ask you guys to think about how you might be able to help support some of this in your areas going forward. So there is a real emphasis on us improving the responsiveness to urgent and emergency care. Um, so reducing weights in ED um, and the things that really sit under the ageing well umbrella are things related to that urgent community response um, team, which many of you will be involved in and how we manage discharges for patients from hospital. 
we need to minimise those handover delays. Um, and again, what is it that we can be doing with our urgent community response services across uh, the North East and North Cumbria to really support that? Um, so what are what is happening in your area with EDs, with um, same day emergency care? What's working in your urgent treatment centres? And what's the gap in your services, in your areas? Um, to be able to support these patients at home where it's the right thing to do and what might you be able to bring to the table to help your system deliver that in a in a different way and really my um, ask of you here is that you all come from a real diverse background and actually what might you know from your work that might contribute to this and if there is something that you think you know about that is happening that others might not, I really would ask you to reach out and make contact um, so that that can be stitched in and, and shared. Next slide, please. So there's a huge bit in the planning guidance around transformation and building community services, and it's all about providing care to people in the best place. Um, and sometimes that is at hospital, but actually more often than not, we can um, provide care in a different way um, at home. So there's a big piece around virtual wards um, there's a lot of work going into uh, how we deliver an urgent community response to our population. So um, how can we respond in a timely fashion with the right team um, to keep people at home where it's the right thing to do? How can we plan for the future? So how can we have conversations with our um, patients, with our people, with our citizens to really think about what's important to them? So the whole what matters to me conversation very much um, using that personalised care and support planning um, approach. We know our care homes have really, really um, taken a brunt through COVID. Um, and whilst there's been fantastic work through the Enhanced Health and Care Home um, DES that was brought in through primary care over um, the last couple of years, we know that there is still a huge amount more to do. Um, we know that there is some fantastic work going on in many care homes but we know that there is still room for improvement um, and we are absolutely wanting to support that going forward and um, channeling resource um, to there where it's the right to do so. And hospital discharge, again, we know anybody that stays in hospital longer than they really need to be there um, have poorer outcomes. So we absolutely want to work with local authorities, partners, hospices, home care, um, et cetera, as best way we can. And again, my ask of you is what might you know about the work that you're doing that might contribute and really to get in touch and let us know. Next slide, please. So again, the community services digital work um, Paul's on the call. I'm sure many of you are involved in digital initiatives. Um, and again, I would ask you if you are doing anything on that digital uh, um, agenda, reach out to Paul because we don't know if you don't tell us and actually being able to connect people and link that up um, will be in everybody's best interests. Next slide, please. So yeah, the digital and information technology, um, I think this is coming back onto you now, Dan. That's right, thanks, yeah. Jen. So I'm happy to, um, oh, Paul's put his um, contact details in the chat. Um, and you'll all be aware of the ICP leads for ageing well for the four different um, areas. So if you do want to reach out and talk to us about any of those elements, please do so. Um, we'd be really keen to hear from you and I'm happy to take any questions. Because that was a whistle stop to it of something that is really complicated. Stunned silence. Lots of things to think about. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, so uh, whistle top stew of all things planning, which whether you're involved or not, obviously is quite important over the next few months and things to try and get best plans possible for all the people going forward. So the next couple of slides really are just some of the updates from our regional work where we think this makes sense for all areas to benefit from. So the ICGA2, which is the Digital Comprehensive Geriatric Tool, we are going to have a, a good chat about that this afternoon, so I'll not go too much on that, but ultimately the pilot is started in January. There's been a delay because of a few things going on over the last 18 months, as we all know about. The work that Jen mentioned around community health 
digital work. What we're trying to do under that umbrella is think about the future anticipatory care model that will be coming out this year uh, through NHS England and it looks as though the main focus or cohort of people that bit of work will be will be around those living with multiple morbidity with or without frailty and how teams can then support those people and that will be a contractual sort of requirement for PCNs primary care networks from the autumn time so what we are trying to do under that sort of sphere is think about how we support people and teams to find these people and then measure what they're doing and then how we can help shape best practice in the, the sort of the offer they give to these people. Uh, you can imagine it's a it's a huge bit of work and it's happening anyway but this is about trying to bring it all together and reduce variation across the system for that. Then we've got the urgent community response that we've talked about and this is all about at this moment in trying trying to develop that 12 hour model of rapid community response this year what nhs england have been trying to do is to get all of community providers who are offering these rapid response services and wider onto a sort of a what they call a data set the community health service data set so we can start measuring this going forward in the future and that's something that's going to be reported publicly from April of this year. We've updated our website uh, we've, that's constantly a bit of a work in progress and we're constantly trying to build that so if you haven't seen it please click on and give feedback that would be great and we're looking at how we embed that within the emerging ICS websites and communication strategies. Uh, from April onwards. And finally, Jackie's story, as people probably know on the call, if not, that's a nice sort of video infographic, which we'll actually see this afternoon, uh, the video of Jackie, where we look at Jackie in different stages of his sort of life course and frailty stages and things. So anything on digital, any questions on digital? Oh, well, I'll just flick on to the next slide. So I might hand over to Leslie Bainbridge if that's all right. Yeah, hi, I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. So new from last time. So I know some of you have just joined us for the first time this afternoon, but I always update new from last last COP. So if you want to know any more of the background stuff before today's update, then obviously um, get in touch with me at any point. So NCOP, Dan's always already mentioned, so that's our workforce development project, competency framework at three levels that we're rolling out around um, the region. We're having a little bit of a refresh of it currently based on the learning that we've got up until up until now. We do have a formal research evaluation project going on, but you know that that is still running along um, in the background. Uh, it's not concluded yet and, and isn't expected to be concluded either. But new from last time is we're currently uh, we're going to explore apprenticeship options with the Health Innovation Network. I don't know whether um, Juliana Thompson, our, our NCOP uh, lead, is on the call this afternoon, but her and I are meeting tomorrow to explore that a little bit more. So I'll, that, that's quite a big thing we're excited about if it comes off, but I'll share the exploration the next time. And then in terms of evidence and research, we're always as interested in what we don't know yet, what answers we might not have yet as much as uh, we are in the evidence for what we absolutely should be doing. So we have had a, a, bit, a, a big bit of um, research going on for a number of months now, and uh, that's concluded with all of the consultation phase and we're busy writing that up. So we'll have some real headlines to share with you the next time. We've had an expert panel review and the aim uh, is really to develop um, an, a toolkit, an evaluation toolkit for frailty pathways because there isn't a consistent way of evaluating frailty pathways, although lots of frailty pathways have been evaluated and some very robustly in their own way. So we've concluded the review, we're busy writing up um, the framework, the toolkit now and can share more with you next time. 
uh, a new bit of um, research that we're, we're hoping to do is the NHSI hydration project. You might have heard that this is going on and there is some funding available to improve hydration status of older adults living with frailty. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Anne, I've got a, a bit of detail for you here. So what the idea is that of the coppers is that we'll take a, re a research approach to develop an educational package. That will be our intervention. We will in, in the beginning focus on care homes, linking it into EHCH, but with a vision to roll it out, particularly into um, DOM care service and supported housing in line with the, the other parts of the EHCH framework, supported housing is now included. And um, the other thing that we're going to do is link it to our NCOP, program so we will develop some some competencies for whatever it is we come up with the rationale for this is there were two measures that you particularly had to look at for this application one was a reduction in um, antibiotic prescribing and the other was a reduction in utis for older adults the coppers that are involved did have experience from having worked in one of the previous um, Vanguard programmes, which have success, successfully reduced both of those things, hospital admissions with, for care home residents with a UTI, and also um, uh, we didn't count the antibiotic prescribing, but had to count the, the oral nutritional supplement prescribing. So the hypothesis, one of them, is that if you saw that reduction in the ONS prescribing, that could well be related to the food first approach and the focus on water rich foods as much as it could be on anything else. So that's the base, uh, the rationale for choosing care homes. In the in the application pack that came through, uh, we have shared that, so you might have seen it. There were a number of um, suggested approaches to reducing to improving hydration care. So what we intend to do, because based on the previous work, there was a comprehensive literature review done. So we intend we intend to revisit that literature review, but also look particularly at what the suggested options were for for this bit of work and then we'll you know we'll tie that into the literature review to identify what the what looks to be the best evidence and but equally um, what the gaps might be we're going to take a collaborative learning approach so we'll have some workshops which will include all of the people particularly the frontliners is to develop the competencies and test that out linking it in with the NCOP program and then as well as those numbers stuff, you know, the antibiotic prescribing, the hospital admissions, and even the incidence of UTIs for care home residents who don't go into hospital, that's never been counted before. And I'll, I'll, I'm interested that we we think about that a little bit more. Uh, but aside from the number stuff, we do want to capture the experiences of the people that might be involved and also whether other things such as the quality of um, that there's a difference in record keeping, particularly intake and output for hydration. So that's the bid that we're working on currently. And um, I think that might be it from me for this month. You're on mute, Dan. Sorry, Jen, I was just wondering if you still want to, are you with us and did you want to jump in on the metrics and outcomes update? Dan, if you can, because I'm struggling with my connection here. That's why I've gone off no, camera. No problem. I'm sorry you can so, so just from a little update, people might know that for the last couple of years, we have had in existence our 23 measures that we've had in the system called our frailty eye care measures that have measured everything really across what we thought best represented an ageing well frailty sort of picture, uh, taken from measures that are currently in existence, currently getting reporting on, and currently basically within people's contracts, so not asking other people to do extra work. And we've played around over the years with that to represent it in a way and use it as a tool for supporting sort of local places in their work as a redesign side of things. So we've managed to get their metrics where possible down to PCN level data. So where we are at the moment with all that 
background work is we're currently looking at which metrics need to stay in and which new ones need to come into that framework because of the merging stuff coming out across the aging well umbrella and various contractual asks and how we present that for local places to you. So the analytics and platform behind that. And we're also looking at how we tie all of this in that measurement bit in with a population health management approach to aging well. So that finding element and supporting people through different cohorts with different levels of needs and different type of support. So we're working very closely with our population health management team within the ICS and are linking in with an analyst who will start to develop a tool which will support the anticipatory care work that needs to happen from autumn onwards, but also the bigger picture around aging well and trying to link sort of data sets together. So it's not just all focused through that NHS lens, but a wider lens of local authority, social care, VCS. So exciting bit of work, big bit of work, uh, but hopefully we'll start to see some momentum on that over the next few months and hopefully we'll be testing some of that out over the next six months within sort of PCN areas and things. So if we just move on to the next slide and we're slowly getting there. So that really concludes a little bit of an update from the regional aging well bits of work. And I wanted to spend probably the next hour or so on probably slowly looking at this CGA tool, this digital CGA tool. Uh, before we start going into that, was there any questions at all about any of that we've run through? Anything you want us to put in the chat? Any other queries? If you don't want to ask, ask any questions today, please just get hold of us. And Richardson's our sort of keeps us all right and keeps us all linked in. So any queries to Anne where the invite came from and she passed stuff on to ourselves and do check out the website. Most of our information is on there and you can, we try to update that on a regular basis, even though it's been a little bit slow recently. Are you doing that lady's help? I don't know. I'm just checking. So someone's came off mute there. I think when he's back there. Perfect. Great. So, Shall we move on to the digital CGA tool? So I'm going to just run through a little, if you just click onto the next slide, Anne. So I'm going to run through a little introduction into frailty and CGA, which I'm sure most of you guys absolutely know, because uh, it'll be your bread and butter stuff. But ultimately for decades, we've been using this sort of disease model type approach. And over the last 10 years or so, we're, we're desperately trying to shape and shift culture, services, the support for people that we give, and think about people living with frailty, trying to find people early before they deteriorate along that frailty sort of trajectory and support them as best as possible within their home to, live them, to allow them to live long, and able lives rather than always trying to, in a way, meet people at times of crisis when it's too late. So we're trying to have that sort of shift that John Young's been talking about for the past decade and so. So the next slide, Anne. This is something that the NHS England team and Dawn Moody put together about shaping conversations around sort of frailty and looking at the multi dimensional nature of frailty because I think the problem is we always think if we're not close to this of a frail older person and things but if you look at frailty in a much more broader agenda you know there's multiple sort of domains to frailty everything from the sort of the physical end through the psychological end the social end environmental end and the reason I'm just showing this slide is because this starts to explore the concept of the comprehensive geriatric assessment tool and why that has been built and set up through a sort of a domain 
approach and things. But if you haven't seen the failed fulcrum, it is a useful little tool, a bit of a thing to look at and to look at the lens of frailty through that sort of angle. So I'll just move up the next slide, Caroline. Sorry, Anne. So this is the comprehensive geriatric assessment tool. So we're probably all familiar with it. And you're probably aware that there is the five domains, the physical, the psychological, functional, social, and environmental. And it is fundamentally the gold standard sort of evidence based supporting people with sort of certain levels of frailty. There's a lot of work went on on this and there's still a huge amount of work going on around the CGA. And Leslie could probably talk all day about the CGA and its origins and the future plans for it and all the work we're doing within the frailty pathway looked at CGA and everything. But fundamentally, it's a, it's a sort of an assessment process, very holistic, and the evidence base often is you start to think about doing this comprehensive needs assessment for people with a certain level of frailty. And keep me right here, Leslie, and others on the call, but it's often the British Geriatric Society recommend considering it, possibly when people start moving into the moderate state of frailty, but certainly you should be doing this for people with severe frailty onwards as the gold standard. And it is the assessment part, but it's a complex, comprehensive assessment, multifaceted and often involving someone who coordinates the process, who understands frailty and but liaising with a, a multi sort of interdisciplinary team for the different domains. And it's a bit of a cycle process. Obviously, you have the assessment ele element of that. You then come up with your problem list that you identify active and inactive problems. Think about goals very much from a personalised agenda, what the person needs, wants. And then you start to move into that sort of personalised, bespoke plan for the individual. Think about what interventions is need, and then you support that. And it's very much a cyclical sort of process, multidisciplinary and multi-agency. So that, in a nutshell, is the sort of the CGA process and journey. So I'll just click on to the next slide, Anne. So that's just what I alluded to. It's predominantly focused around and should be considered those with moderate frailty and beyond, really. So we'll jump in. Next slide there, Anne. So I just wanted to highlight this because everybody theoretically is talking about CGAs. And it was traditionally, the origins very much were in that sort of specialist environment in secondary care. But obviously, as time has moved on, as care places have moved on, and we've started seeing increasing shift into community-based sort of support, we are starting to see the CGA come contractually into other professional sort of contracts and work environments. a &E departments are expected to start things like this, depending on frailty risk. Obviously, it sits in bread and butter for community services and working in older people's services. And more recently, it's been brought into primary care general practice contracts and it can be a challenge to do because we know it is a holistic assessment often involving multiple conversations and taking time to do properly by experienced individuals who understand frailty and complex needs but there's times when you probably need to do cgas just after times of crisis where you know the person's probably that risk of deterioration and that there might be a trigger that this person really hasn't had a CGA and they may certainly benefit from one, such as the times of crisis response, deterioration, being into a &E departments, discharge from hospitals, things like that. Then there's the proactive element where 
you think people are that vulnerable that you think mm, if we could get in there early, do the needs assessment, develop the care plan with them, maybe that would help support and coordinate care. So some of the stuff coming through in contracts, we're seeing this within the new anticipatory care contract. It's core to the, the care home model and the MDT models, but it's also potentially and available within other worlds such as the LD, autism and cohorts and even in virtual wards now and things. So you can see it coming through this comprehensive needs assessment as core to a lot of our work that we do as professionals. So it's trying to understand how you can do a CGA in the 21st century with the siloed working, the multi with different teams working in different places and all of the the communication challenges that we, we still face really when the CGA requires true interdisciplinary working with robust communication. So next slide. So I think we're getting on finally to the digital CGA tool after we've set the scene and things for you there. And I might hand over to Caroline at this stage, is that all right, Caroline? Or do you want me to quickly run through this one? Oh, it wasn't letting me unmute there. Um, if you want to run through the first few points, because I think that's just kind of talking about the actual CGA toolkit itself, isn't it? Um, no, no problem. So I've, I've probably mentioned most of this Obviously, hopefully, the, as we go through the sort of the, the tool itself, it'll become self-explanatory, but it's based on the British Geriatric Society, five domains. We've tried to embed some sort of evidence-based tools within it and allow people to walk through the different domains. And we've done this quite robustly with multiple sort of different professional groups and things. And our ultimate aim at this point in time is to see whether this has any added value to currently what is happening because CGs are happening and they are core to people's working. Our aim is to see whether we've got any added benefit of using a digital version of this tool. So we'll probably come on to this later, but it's very much around the feasibility of this tool in our current first phase of, of evaluation and whether it is workable and whether it gives us added benefits. And I think we do have some of our academic colleagues on the call who we can talk a little bit more around about evaluation phase one going forward. And obviously there's the whole debate which we can get into about push and pull of information and sharing of information, which is probably going to be in our phase to in later and we'll talk about that a little bit but i'll hand over to caroline who will probably just give us the, the nuts and bolts of the two yeah yeah sorry do you want to go on the next slide and yeah sorry i've put lots of animations on this slide oh no that's brilliant um I thought I'd put I thought I'd put an animation next to every single point here, but that's probably just as well that I didn't. So um yeah, the digital pathway um that we have designed and that is built and that is currently live and just starting to be used. Um if we take it from the start, you know, we have a patient management platform, which you will get to see when I give a demonstration of the platform, um, well of the pathway. So yeah, the patient details are added onto there and then they can be assigned to a coordinator and that's the person that you're looking to do this data collection, to do the CGA data collection. They would be able to pick up that they have that assigned to them, that they have the patient assigned to them and then they can log into our app and that can be on their mobile phone, it can be via a tablet, it would probably obviously look better and would probably more likely to be a tablet. Um, they can also do that via their laptop as well if they have a laptop and they prefer to use that. But they're presented there with the means to um, record information across the five different domains of the um, of the CGA. Um, so they yeah they they can work through each of the domains in whichever order that they like. They can complete half a domain and then come back at a later point. 
but ultimately are in, in there as well. Point number four, we do have lots of links in there actually to the CJA Toolkit website, which itself from there you can actually access um, the tools, uh, some of which you can actually interact with, which we'll be able to see in the demo. So that if a person, if a coordinator answers a question in a certain way, they might be prompted to, um, oh, you might want to consider completing this tool. Well, they can actually be linked off to go and have a look at that there and then, and then come back and continue with their, their completing any of the forms. Eventually, you, we want to get to a point where all of the data collection that the coordinator deems is necessary is complete um, and that they are happy at that point to be completing an active problem list for each of the five domains. So currently what happens with our pathway, they're prompted to complete an active list for each domain. Um, and then what happens is our uh, pathway amalgamates those lists into one and currently that is then um, for them, um, you can we output that as a PDF at the moment. And obviously with the PDF that can be sent to whoever it can be uploaded to clinical systems. Um, you know, we'll come on to in a bit kind of where the, the thoughts are in future in terms of um, like Dan was saying with pushes and pulls of information and, and what we might be able to do going forward. But at the moment we have the PDF um, and in point number six, consideration of MDT involvement or not, um, you know, hopefully the tool will, you'll be able to see when we use it, we prompt at the end of each domain, whether or not actually do do, do we need um, MDT involvement? Um, and, and we can use the tool to kind of involve those people in different ways. Um, and then point number seven, um, the generation of the personalised care and support plan. So that at the moment is out with the digital pathway as it stands. But, you know, I do believe we'll be potentially looking at that being part of the digital pathway as well. So that all keeps it nicely wrapped up um, in, in, in the one digital place um, because the active problem list chair yeah, should then be should be used to inform what the um, care and support support plan looks like. But uh, yeah, that's that's the pathway in a, in a nutshell, basically. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Jackie, who you may have all seen uh, as our case study for Caroline to then talk us through using the CGA tool. So we've just got a little video for a few minutes that really just talks about Jackie and his life and you can see how we pull out the elements of Jackie's life into the CGA. We we were using the point at which the the person who's doing the CGA probably goes to meet Jackie at the stage of moderate to see a severe frailty because that will be the stage that you may be thinking about your CGA. So if we just play the video on if that's all right. Everybody has a story. Meet Jackie. Jackie was born at home in Gateshead in 1931, pre-NHS, when access to healthcare depended upon your ability to pay for it. Leaving school at 14, Jackie took up a bricklaying apprenticeship with the local council, a skilled trade and a job that he loved. At 18, Jackie was called up for national service and saw war as a soldier in Korea. During this time, a ricocheting bullet in the tin hut he lived left him with permanent hearing damage. Just before leaving Korea, he contracted malaria, which he recovered from with no long-term consequences. Picking up his beloved trade, Jackie settled back into civilian life, setting up a small business, getting married at 27, and going on to have four children. At age 37, he had an accident at work with a circular saw. Surgeons managed to save his thumb, and although his right thumbnail never grew back, there was no loss of function. At 66, he was diagnosed with high blood pressure, then at age 70 with type 2 diabetes. His medical records tell us that both of these conditions were well managed for many years by the primary care team. A major change occurred for Jackie at age 77, when osteoarthritis in his right knee forced him to stop working. 79 it was planned that he would have a knee replacement but before the operation he got a blood clot in his lung. The medication for this meant his knee replacement had to be delayed. 
Medication completed and waiting for his knee op, Jackie suffered a stroke. This left him with mild weakness in his right side, which, together with his chronic knee pain, restricted his mobility and left him reliant on a walking aid to get around. Not long after this, he suffered his first fall, but returned home to the care of his wife. At age 80, Jackie's world was turned upside down when, after a short illness, his wife passed away. For a few months, his family supported him in his own home, but after three further falls, he moved in with his daughter. This move helped him to cope with his bereavement, as well as easing the caring burden for his loved ones, who were empowered through their involvement in the creation of a personal care package, addressing each of the CGA's five elements. Following two further falls, home carers were introduced for breakfast and lunch and to assist with Jackie's personal care. The family were also helped by the availability of 24-7 rapid response community care services, which helped Jackie avoid being admitted to hospital during this time. At 82, Jackie's family took him to A&E thinking he'd suffered another stroke. This was ruled out, however, the frailty team physiotherapist identified that he couldn't stand up as straight as usual or follow conversations as he normally would, the cause for which was unknown. These functional changes meant stepping down to intermediate care wasn't an option, so he was admitted to hospital under the care of a geriatrician, where he was subsequently diagnosed with a bleed on the brain and received emergency surgery in a specialist neurological unit. The surgery was successful and five days later he was back on his feet under the care of the same geriatrician as before for ongoing medical care and rehabilitation. A lead community care professional worked with the hospital therapy team to ensure Jackie's discharge home was timely and safe and rehabilitation was incorporated into his care plan. Jackie went on to live another few months with frailty, eventually passing away peacefully before his 83rd birthday from an unrelated condition. Everybody has a story. As care professionals, we're all more than the person who comes to work. And by the same token, every patient is more than they present to the clinician. Although frailty only impacted Jackie towards the end of his life, considering Jackie's life more holistically gives us a fuller understanding of him as an individual and allows us to provide better frailty care for him and others like him, rather than just focusing upon illnesses and conditions. So what we're going to try and do now with Caroline is explore the ICGA through Jackie's story. And I just want to just want to mention that that was a real life story. Uh, we haven't made anything up. So that was the richness of someone's life there. And this is why the CGA is the, the, the mechanism to try and tease all that out so you can get that personalised sort of care and support plan in place for the person. So it was a, a true life story that I'll just hand back over to Caroline now. You might be sharing your own screens that way, right, Caroline. I am, yeah. Let me just do that now. And obviously, Dan, Leslie, feel free to jump in and interrupt at any point to help um, you know, tell this story. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, we can see it now, Caroline. Brilliant. So yeah, you, you are looking at the moment. This is um, where it, it's where in our platform that um, you can manage your your patients. So from the point of view, if that I'm a coordinator, I've logged in for the day, and I am um, going to see who it is. Oh, I've just um, give me two seconds. I've just realised that I've started the pathway on myself rather than on rather than on Jackie. <laughs> so give me two moments. You'll be able to see that prior to this, um, we did actually I did actually create much as a, you know a real life clinician would do. I actually created um, a record for for Jackie in our patient management platform. 
um, and, and, and that can be done by a linking up to GP systems. So actually the details would just pull through. So I'm going to start the service for Jackie because I would like Jackie I would like Jackie to receive a comprehensive assessment. I'm going to say that I don't have a CFS score, but obviously if you do have one, you can input it. And I want the care coordinator for this person to be Caroline. So I'm going to assign that to myself. So you'll see if we take it from the point of view, this is me now, I'm the coordinator. I'm going to log in for the day and see who it is. So there we go. We can see, actually, there we go. I've got two new patients lined up. I've got Caroline and then I've actually got Jackie as well. And I can see that I need a care. I need uh, an assessment for both of them. So I'm going to say that's absolutely fine. Let's um, let's acknowledge that Jackie needs this assessment. And I'm going to put a little bit of detail in um, as to what my approach for this is going to be. So I do actually have that on record. There we go. And then essentially the main data collection starts from there. So you'll see that for Jackie, that we do have a capacity and consent aspect to it. So this is um, a, a before we actually dive straight into the five different domains. Uh, there are some questions, first of all, to be to be asked to ensure um, that that full consent um is given or or you know capacity is is considered so you see here if i actually indicate that there is an impairment or a disturbance i'm asked to consider whether or not the person lacks capacity and i'm asked certain questions to help me consider this i can say that the person lacks capacity that can be my judgment on that but if I still want to continue in the patient's best interests, I absolutely can. But we can see if I answer no to that. Next. Do, does the patient consent to undergoing the comprehensive assessment? Um, so this is where, you know, the person has said, yes, I'm happy to be assessed. And actually as well, we need to make sure uh, that they're happy with the data being shared um, so there they would be presented with the name of um, you know the actual organization so perhaps the GP practice but we do also have on there um, the universities and ourselves as well and I'm going to try and switch over here if my wi-fi will allow me um, as you can see if I wanted to complete this in in this management platform if I wanted to collect the data there I could but it is actually more designed to be used on a um, a tablet I don't have a tablet that has allowed me to um, the ones in the office they wouldn't actually allow me to download the screen sharing software so I'm doing this on my phone so it might not um render 100% as well as if I was using a bigger device, but I still think it gives a little bit of a better idea of, um, of what this would look like. So if I was a coordinator and I was out and I actually went to go and visit Jackie, um, you know, in his daughter's home, I can access this via our app. I have set up a pin to enable me to, um, to get in there quite easily. So that's just me logging into our app. I'm going to go through and let that do a refresh. Apologies, our Wi-Fi gets um, gets really slow in the afternoon here. So this is my patient list. And we can see there we have Jackie's story. And if I wanted to search for Jackie instead of scrolling down that list, I, I could have done. So 
we have the domains. We do have an option there that you can see which says change care coordinator. Um, it, it's not just me that would have access to that. Um, anybody else could log in at any time. Say if I if I had to um, take time off work for a couple of weeks and somebody needed to take over, other people with access to the system would be able to access that particular particular area and, and assign this to somebody else. And I'll come back to the domain completion summary at the top in a bit. But essentially, you can see here we have the five different domains, so we've split them up in that way. So I can do these in any order, but I'm going to start with the social assessment. So where is the information gathering taking place? Well, that's in Jackie's daughter's home, because that's where I've gone out to do the visit. Who am I collecting it from? Jackie himself and also his relatives that are also there as well. How is the patient presenting? He's quite alert today. And yeah, I've asked um, his relatives um, as to an opinion on his current health and well-being. Is the person known to social care? Yes. So all of these questions you can see I'm going to go through. We can we'll be able to see each of the questions there, but you'll see that they are optional. So it's not that every single question will has to be answered and I won't answer every single question as we go through this. Um, so we know that he left school at 14. And his current uh, his previous occupation even was a bricklayer. that he um he loved it not going to take place take place of residence um living with their children so that is where he is doesn't care for anybody but somebody does help to provide the care and i'm going to put the daughter's name in they're not registered as housebound and they do feel safe. He does feel safe inside of his home. And I don't have any safeguarding concerns with regard to that. And he doesn't manage the household independently. So if we will go through a little bit more, you can see there's questions there about things such as outside activities. We look at household finances. About whether or not the person drives. We've asked before if they feel safe, if he feels safe inside of his home, but actually what about outside? If I said no again, do you get prompted about if there's any safeguarding concerns. So we do have the two safeguarding concern prompts in, um, but that's just because one is coming off the back of inside the home and the other is coming off the back of outside of the home. It's about um, ever smoking tobacco. We said no. Have a drink, uh, Jackie. Very occasionally has a drink, so I'm going to record that as a as a monthly a monthly event. And then we have certain questions here about whether or not he feels his life is well balanced, and if he's being disturbed by his faith or spirituality. And then we get to the bottom of the survey, and we can see that it's flagging up there at the bottom that I indicated earlier on that the person is known to social care. Um, so that now would, would also flag up on the other forms as well. Um, when, if, say if you went and filled this one in, went away and then did a different one, that will always flag up now just so that, and it might even be that parts of these forms go off to different people. So that flag will be there now that Jackie is known to social care. And you can see there's a number of actions at the bottom and this, this is the same for each of the domains. Um, you know, you can see there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, about consideration of MDT members, non-MDT members as well, whether or not you wish to discuss overall the data collection um, and, and, you know, your thoughts and the active problem lists at an MDT. Um, the refer for investigations diagnostics, we're thinking about things like bloods here. So actually that's kind of a placeholder 
um, just so that you, um, you know, it is sort of indicating that you're waiting for certain things to go back before you say that you're quite happy with this certain section in terms of the active problem list. Um, you know, at some point when we're saying we'd like to refer it to certain people, we can absolutely do that. People can be given access to this platform. You can say what it is or the reason why you're referring it. You would then be prompted to pick from a drop down list potentially who it is you're referring it to. And those people would, much in the same way you saw at the start of this, um, the person logged in, they saw that they had something there they needed to look at. Um, it, it, you know, it, would, it, would, it could act much the same for those people. I'm going to say that actually I'm quite happy with regards to this domain. I, I, I'm, I'm happy that I can complete the active problem list for this and I don't feel like I need to refer to anybody else. And actually for this domain, um, I'm, I'm going to say that actually I'm quite content with that. We do get people, we do prompt a bit to say, just to say you definitely sure you're absolutely happy the problem is complete. And just to say that once that's gone, um, you can't like reaccess it after that. So there it, it goes, there you go. That's the social domain um, complete. We move on to the physical. Going to take a little look at this. You'll see that we have at the top the same questions um, around the information gathering context. Um, we have these at the top of each one in case um, actually the domains might, the context might differ between the domains. Um, we could have it that actually it pulls through what was entered previously, but it can be overwritten if, if, if there is different. That is something that we could potentially look at doing. You can see at the moment it, it's just asking me for an answer, but they're optional, so I won't write those in again. And um, we have two things here where we ask people to record long term conditions and significant medical history. Um, these, you know, this is something where we would ideally look for this information to actually be pulling from the clinical record so that actually it's presented to the coordinator when they go out um, to complete this. Um, that piece of work um, hasn't um, been fully um, investigated yet. So for the time being, and it is optional, there is the option for the um, coordinator to type in um, to type in those aspects so that they would have them presented in front of them when they came to, to fill this form out. So I'll just type a few. We know that Jackie um, suffered permanent hearing damage from the age um, of 18. So I'll just type a few of his aspects in here. Um, significant med med um, medical history even. So I put minor ENT up. Um, is that? And yes, we know. So you see, we go through a number of observations here. So we've got the lying blood pressure. We go through standing blood pressure, pulse rate, respiratory rate can also be um, recorded. And after that, there is also the option to record. Um, where Jackie is on the uh, breathlessness scale. Um, oxygen saturation can also be recorded. Um, and now we're getting into specific, um, you know, areas of the body where where problems might lie. So actually with um, Jackie, there is an issue with um, his skin. So I'm going to record what that is in there. There we go. Problems with bladder, actually, yes. And then we can see below, I have been, that, that amber pop-up box has come up. It's asked me to consider taking a further assessment um, with the Bartel index. So you're gonna be able to see here how we move away from the form. And we come in at the CGA toolkit. So this is yeah, so CGA Toolkit Plus. So if I came to here and I wanted to see 
actually, let's have a look at actually what the Bartel index looks like. I can. So this isn't one of the interactive forms, but you can still see there the items that you would be um, you would be scoring, and it um, shows you you know what those scores actually mean. So you could you could use that, and then you can see if I press back. Of course, for safety reasons, security reasons, it's going to ask me to put my pin in again just to make be on the safe side. Um, and we'll just um, we'll, we'll give Jackie full marks for this one. Um, the outcomes of the Bartel index 100. So I'm going to record that in there because we did that with um, we did that with Jackie. Problems with feet. I'm just going to put in here that actually he does see a podiatrist. We ask questions on bodily pain that links to various tools if people want to use the Abbey pain scale comes up there. Um, medication. So I'm going to record. Orphan. And allergies, yes, we're going to penicillin. So you can see there's lots of this, this questions to do with, with medication there. We've linked off as a suggestion to the stop start tool and then ask for the outcomes of the medication review. And then there's questions about um, you know, whether or not certain um, documents have play, uh, are in place. Just going to scroll up here. And uh, you know, with this section, I think we talked a lot about it might be that actually um, we we would like um, we would like the person we would like you know the coordinator might wish somebody else to undertake a medication review, at which point it could be actually we'll refer to an MDT member, we'll ask that person to complete the review, and um, for the sake of this demo because we don't actually have that connected up with anybody to receive it, I'm going to say I would like it to be discussed. At, um, at MDT, um, I'm going to say it needs to review, so that's my reason. So we've got that on file, but I'm going to say otherwise I am happy with that as I've completed it. Um, just to give a bit of an idea about what that top task means, um, the domain completion summary, I'll click back to patient management portal and hope that it hasn't logged me out in the meantime. It hasn't. I mean, you can also access this on. Actually, you can access it on the mobile device as well. If I click in there. Um, and just do it. I need to do a refresh. Sorry, the Wi-Fi in here is terrible. Right, let me I'll search for Jackie this time. Shall we find Jackie? There we go. There's Jackie. So we can see, so we've built in um, a, a completion summary um, so that both the coordinator and then potentially other people who, you know, we who can be given access to this could actually, if they wanted to see in a snapshot um, how far through the CG is, they can do that using that tool. So I'm just going to come out of that and continue with the assessment. So we've got the functional assessment here. You can see at the top we have a bit which says issues highlighted. So we do have it where certain parts of the, um, the survey, if you fill them in in a certain way and indicate certain problems, they actually pull through and flag at the top of the other domains. So we've tried to kind of link up what might be relevant from one to the other. So I've come into functional and it's telling me that in that that person has problems with their feet. So we've done that with a few different data points throughout. So again, the contacts questions, um, and then we have things about whether or not the person um, wears glasses, sight disorders, and then we get into hearing. Um, we know uh, Jackie's hearing was permanently damaged. Various questions on communication. 
and then questions around things that they may have um, difficulty with, such as eating and drinking um, and preparing their food and drinks. And actually, can they go to the shop to actually buy um, the food? And then getting into questions about whether or not they've been eating less in the past six months. And then we, we, we get into the calculation um, about the uh, the potential risk of weight loss. So it's asking me um, to record the height of, of, of Jackie. And I've chosen, I'm going to go um, feet and inches. Jackie's five foot ten. Um, we're going to ask for the previous weight as well. And I'm going to go for stones and pounds. And then asking for current weight as well. And I'm going to say, actually. And it calculates, so under that, you can see it has calculated the BMI, it's calculated the undernutrition risk score as well. And also it has in brackets what, what that score translates as. And then we get into um, looking at um, the, the kind of falls assessment that we have around this. So Jackie has had fall in the last 12 months. Um, but hasn't fallen since um, started using Walker. So I'll make sure that that's um, recorded. So Jackie hasn't had any fractures. He's not on four medications or more a day, but definitely um, feels unsteady and has problems with balance um, and then there's also the instructions to do a timed up and go test if the care, co care coordinator even wishes to do that and then it's asked after that did it take them more than 12 seconds and um, we're going to say that it did take Jackie um, more than 12 seconds to do that so those questions with regards oh I've just realized I've come off the screen I've lost connection. Okay, bear with me. I don't know why that's done that. There we go, I'm back. <laughs> right. There we go. I'm gonna ask for my pen again. There we go. So yeah, you can see here falls test recommendation. Consider consider discussing this person's fall risk further. And we know that could be the prompt, as we say, to have that referring somewhere. I'm going to say <coughs> that I don't think there's necessarily any further things, um, any further actions. Oh, I'm just going to get a drink of water. But I'm going to say in my active problem list, actually, can we consider strength and balance course? <coughs> and a falls assessment. Um, OK, and then there's two, two domains left. You can see we've got the environmental assessment. Um, and that's alerting to me that actually I indicated that Jackie doesn't feel safe outside of his house. Um, so that's one of the pull throughs in that part. The first question, really thinking about it from an environmental point of view, is asking if the person's known to occupational therapy. So I can indicate there, yes, there. And then um, rather than actually have a, a set of questions, which, um, you know, to answer, really the thing here is just is, is to get the uh, coordinator to consider whether or not they think that a full assessment um, 
is necessary. So we've tried to give some prompts in there for the care coordinator to actually um, consider. And then at the end of that, if they say yes, we record why. So we're going to say for Jackie, actually, um, you know, yes. Jackie's now living with his daughter. And certain adaptations are needed to her home. I'm going to say I'd like to discuss that at MDT. Oh. Bath adaptations required. Wheelchair. Okay. Oh. So that's the environmental section complete. And we have the psychological. And we've we've got a part at the top, which is um, really just a kind of guide uh, the coordinator to really consider what is normal for 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 Jackie um, and endeavor to build on that picture. Um, so really trying to get that sense of yeah, of what is normal for him. Um, you know, we've said in this assessment, the information's being taken both from Jackie and from his relatives, um, which would be really useful. So we're asking, does the person have a history of mental health problems, for example, depression or anxiety? We have a yes, no, during the last month, if they've been bothered by feeling down, depressed or hopeless. You can see there that links off to the two GDS resources there. Have they had problems with feeling anxious? I'm going to say, um, you know, Jackie um, has feeling a little anxious at times. You can see that I can link through to the tool for the GAD7, and that's actually an interactive tool. So you can see there I can actually complete that on my phone and, um, and be given um, the score and also given the interpretation of that score. So I'm going to say actually, Two out of 21, actually normal, link to bereavement and moving home. Diagnosis of dementia, no. Are we concerned about Jackie's memory? Yes. So a history of delirium, and then there's some details that are asked around that. About circumstances and what follow-up actions were taken, whether a memory test was undertaken. Does Jackie actually appear to be confused? And I'm going to say I'm happy to complete the active problem list for this. Um, I'm going to suggest a dementia screen for that. So yes, so that is all of the data collection complete. Um, obviously, I didn't sit and, 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 and write out um, massively comprehensive active problem lists there. But if I come back to the main management screen here, if I go into Jackie's record, there we go, there's Jackie. We can see that actually there exists a PDF which will have amalgamated together all of the separate active problem lists. And yeah, that's um and, and that can be distributed um however it needs to be. So yeah, that is currently where the pathway the pathway um ends with the problem list to go on to inform further discussions in the care plan as as needed. Oh, I'll stop sharing my screen now.
Great. Thanks, Great. Caroline. So I've got Perfect. to say that that's the quickest CGA I've ever seen done. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've we've got to be mindful of people who probably understand CG and do it, this process can be take a number of days, if not weeks, really. So even though it looked a lot that was happening there, we've got to remember it is a often a quite a complicated, coordinated process. There's been quite a number of sort of questions in the chat and things. I think one question, Caroline, that came up was you lost some connection there. Does it auto save with loss of connection and all that sort of stuff? Can you give us a bit of the techie side? I can give a little bit of the techie side. So it it, it does automatic. It does save. So actually, yeah, if you're using the app, um, and this sometimes happens when it's used in the care homes where we have the digital care home pathways. If they don't have connectivity at a point in time, it, it stores it. It will allow you to submit that data. So for you, you've done it, it's gone and it just gets stored until the Wi-Fi connectivity is restored and then that pushes it into the platform. So yeah, keeps it. <laughs> Great. Great. I've just seen one question there, but jump in any time. I think Anna's asked whether does it upload onto the patient clinical record with the SNOMED codes? So, so this is this is an ongoing conversation, Anna. And we have actually used the word codified all the elements of the CGA on the, with the SNOMED codes and everything, uh, because that is where we thought we might be at within phase one. But as you can imagine, lots been happening. So we've got the whole tool with the appropriate SNOMED codes. Where we are at the moment is we just want to look at the feasibility of the tool itself and the practicalities of the tool we initially thought phase one might be with that linked into the primary care record directly but i think there was a few concerns with push and pull of data and the some of the technical challenges for that at this point in time we're hoping i think i'm not sure if mark donan's left the call now our regional digital lead we're hoping as we work through phase one and looking at the tool, we're having parallel conversations with the bigger interoperability question around linking into the, the primary care system. So it's codified, it's just the green light to press the button and how we do it is probably the next question that's currently getting explored. I'm looking at a few other email conversations just about could patients complete this themselves and could it be a patient facing element to it uh, and I think there's a, a few questions about auto population of different bits and bobs and things so I think the auto population thing's interesting because obviously there's elements of the CGA that could be auto populated from primary care records and things like that um but i think it's in it's mixed into that interoperability conversation uh because purely where we're at is if somebody puts a, a dementia diagnosis on this platform and we were pushing information through into primary care you can imagine the sort of the conversation that that would create if a, if a new diagnosis went into the system and all the alerts then got generated within primary care and the unintended consequences of that. So the push and pull bit and the pre-populating bit is all wrapped up within that interoperability conversation with our sort of digital colleagues, so Great North Care Record, HIE and Health Information Exchange Platform and things. Does that sound right? Caroline, I'll show you marks on the call still, or any other of our techie people. Yeah. Oh, was someone else going to speak there? No. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. That sounds that sounds right. Um, and and just from the perspective of of us in in our sort of technology platform, um. Yeah, getting the data out of our platform and into the clinical system is, um, I want to say easier, but I don't know if it's necessarily easier, but we have a proven track record of doing it. 
obviously, as you say, Dan, it's the working out of actually what's that going to mean when it lands at the other end. But we can definitely do that once it's agreed what those snowmeds are going to be. Um, I, I think slightly coming back the other way is the one where um, we, we, we are not used to doing that. But we do know that it is possible. It's just working out exactly how to go about doing that. Great. Do you want to mention anything about the patient facing element or the person facing element? Because I think Lindsay mentioned this, Lindsay Oliver, uh, and, I, and I put a bit of response in the box there because it brings a whole new dimension really into sort of holistic assessments and CGA and all that sort of stuff. Is there anything from a, a technical, just from a technical aspect of Caroline, because obviously I know Health Call have a lot of patient person facing type digital sort of apps and things like that. Is this a possibility for something like this if we adapted something or looked at something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's exactly what we what we do. Yeah, um, it, much in the same way as you saw me complete that on my phone, the patient could have access to that. Like you say, you might want to adapt the way it looks, feels, the wording of certain things because you've got a different audience. And and yeah, it, it, it's, I suppose the bigger bits you'd be looking at is how is that initial communication, like the onboarding taking place so that the patient understands, um, you know, how they can go about and access it. But yeah, we can we can potentially, people who like to be, who indicate they, they would like to be communicated with via their mobile phone, it could be we send them a text message with a link to this and they can go in and do it. It could be that we send them an email. It could be neither of those things. It might be in a, a, there's various ways and means that we have to meet the various, the different needs of different users where actually, yeah, and it's, it can be security protected. So uh, what I showed you was like our, what we call our professional app, but we have a patient facing app as well, but it's much the same way. They could download that onto their phone and kind of at their leisure, go in and out of it and complete bits and it'll save it and it'll send them back. And then if they want to go back in and do a bit more the next day and build that that kind of record up, absolutely they can do it. Um, or it might be that they prefer, they don't want to download an app on their phone or they don't have a phone, um, but we can email them a link out that they can access. That there is this different ways and means of working out and you can have all of those available if you've got a population actually you know, we need every single option available. Like we we can do that as well. It's just sitting down and working out the needs and how best to do it. Yeah. And some of that, I think, Lindsay, will come out in the evaluation because, like you said in the very beginning, Dan, when you introduced this part of the agenda, the the evaluation is about what will this add, what added value do we get? Because from a clinical perspective, we know the evidence base for CGA is sound. We know that it's sound, particularly for those living with moderate and severe frailty. And some of it will be about what will what might we want to do next. So before we know that we would want the patient to look at this. The, the question we'll, we'll, we'll want to understand is what prompts us to make that referral to the coordinator anyway in that MDT discussion, perhaps? What would prompt the MDT to say this person needs a comprehensive assessment? And they are the things that, you know, we don't have the answers to yet, but we have got the phase one evaluation, which will look at what is the added value and where we might want to go next. As it, it could be, um, you know, in a whole range of, a whole range of places, I guess. Really, today we're very much focusing on the digital side of it and what the application is. What we haven't talked about particularly, although we have in many of the meetings, is what is the, the evidence base? Why do we think this is a good thing to do? And then, you know, from that, we've got to think about, well, how might we launch it? Because what we will need is a common understanding of the benefits of CGA, what's underpinning it, what's it all about. People will need that common understanding. Otherwise, we're carrying a risk and we'll always carry a risk of people being able to use a digital tool and fill a lot of boxes in, but it not have any impact on the patient's life or the work and life of the professionals. So we've got all of those things that are running parallel and are underpinning that we're not particularly talking about today. We're, we're talking about um, this is what the, the tool looks like and this is what we'll be focusing on in the initial pilot. 
Great, thanks, Leslie. As as just to reiterate what I said, this is the start of something. This is literally the start of something, and there might be many different angles to it, or it might be an angle that doesn't go too far. And I think we are very honest with that. We are we we never shout too early. We always like to robustly evaluate things, and it's just important learning if this doesn't work. That's really just as important. So I just want to I want to put that out there. But we're we're looking at it from multiple angles, really, from a feasibility. Obviously, the anticipatory care stuff on a lot of people's minds uh, with it coming out within the primary care networks and everything in absolutely the CGA or the holistic assessment is a core part of that model that NHS England have put together and things. So it certainly could be something that could be explored and used and it'd be, it'd be doing anyway, paper versions or whatever places are doing at the moment. But it is something that we could use. What we didn't get into and what the, the reason why we didn't get into it, dare I say, is the beginning bit of this pathway. So being very sorry, prescriptive about the people who should have a CGA, because we think that is local determination. We know there's guidance there. We know there's elements of if you've got a, a clinical frailty score of six or more, if you're moderate frailty, you're, you're probably going to benefit from a CGA. But we never wanted to get into that prescriptive nature. And on the back of that, we didn't want to get into the prescriptive nature about who should be doing it. So Karen's asked a question about who should do this. And I think the challenge here is the people who should do this, who have the competencies of looking after older people and have an understanding of frailty should be the people who are doing this. The language is very different in many different places around the region. We've got the national language coming down for different roles around what care coordinators are and things like that. So we, we didn't want to get into that sort of confusing language conversation. What is interesting though, what we will be evaluating and my academic colleagues will keep me right here, There'll be a big workforce element to this. And Leslie might want to mention a bit that we've we've chose a couple of PCNs with slightly different sort of uh, the working slightly differently and a different workforce element to help us tease out some of those workforce issues or competencies of things. And it, I think it ties nicely into the NCOP work that's happening across the region and things. Did you want to mention anything on that, Leslie, or anybody else? No, Blender or just to, to pick up on your point about um, where we're going to pilot and why we're going to pilot. So we are going to pilot with people who already have a, a, a great understanding of what a CGA is, what the evidence base is, how you would do one. They've got experience of non-digital versions of using that. Also experience of working in MDTs. We're focusing in one area on those that are living with frailty within a care home and in another area, those that are living with frailty in their own homes. So we can we can think about sort of three organisations, primary care, the independent sector with care homes, but led by the community health services nurse and then nurses who are working in primary care. But really the point is that for the first pilot it is people who are already highly knowledgeable and skilled in CGA um, on the basis of what I said before you know what today we're talking about a digital tool and running underneath it and running parallel to it is the whole evidence base of of what a CGA is and how it can positively impact if you go back to the intro film the little animation of Jackie's life the very final slide slide of that was CGA saves lives and it does save lives but the evidence is when it's used for those living with moderate and severe frailty so if we want to move comprehensive assessment to other groups of people we'll need to evaluate it ourselves in you know in a different way um, and it's anticipatory care you just mentioned there well if you think about what Caroline said about you can have active and inactive problems well if you want if you have an inactive problem one of the best ways of anticipating care would be to understand you've got an inactive problem that you could anticipate it exacerbating and you could your care plan could be focusing on how you might prevent that happening and how you might improve um, you might anticipate care through focusing on an inactive problem. It's really complex 
So to, I'll say again, we're just talking about the digital tool today and we'll learn so much um, and we'll, we'll have to learn to talk about our findings in line with the evidence and the process that we go through. Thanks, Leslie. Just to mention a little bit about the pilot, so keep me right here, but we it has been delayed, but we've started now in January and our aim is for a six month pilot, having taken us up towards the end of May. Does that sound about right, colleagues? So I've got some nods there. So I think phase two, obviously based on all the learning that we're doing in phase one, will be likely towards beginning of sort of June time, realistically. Uh, five months I've been told so probably taken up yeah towards the end of May and things but I think one person mentioned a little bit about this happening in silos they're not being transferred to other areas we, we're very mindful that this is a regional bit of work and we think it will benefit people mostly but on workforce mostly but also it's probably could be tested and used in different settings so we did at the very beginning explore, is there a role for testing this in sort of community hospitals or things like that? Or at the interfaces of care, people coming out of the acute sector into the, the discharge pathways and things like that. So we're very mindful that further work and evaluation will have to happen and things. But we're, we're here as a regional sort of team and approach that we will be linking up this conversation and reporting back our findings whether they're good or bad and that's the main purpose of this it might be that we feel this is not moving in the direction of travel therefore we're not going to go down a certain avenue or we might find there's huge benefits but the benefits are probably in another area and i think that's the whole purpose of phase one so we don't start setting things up before we even really understand the benefits of this digital element to the CGA process. So I think Janet mentioned, could we share the, obviously the this is recorded and we share all our slides and everything, and we're here all the time for uh, emails and things. Did you want to ask whether we could share the demo, Janet? I'm, I'm not sure that means technically, but well, that's Caroline. <laughs> And I don't know if it's possible, but I just thought there's a huge number of people on the call who are working in quite different settings and are probably starting to get their head around how this might fit um, in their workplace and what they would want from the tool. And I just wondered whether if the demo was in any way able to be shared with teams, they might be able to give some input into their thoughts on that moving forward. It might not be the right time, but it just to me, the more engagement people have and the opportunity to influence it, as we go along seems really important. Sorry, is that for me? <laughs> is it about the sharing of the recording for the video, the this? Yes, that's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I'm, I'm sure people- We are actually, we are looking to make a, a, a video of it internally as well, so that we've got it nicely, kind of so it demonstrates what it is. And um, we were meant to start work on that before Christmas, but then we lost the person who was the video expert. So there's a couple of us, um, yeah, getting stuck in with the software. So, but definitely whatever was recorded here can be can be shared for now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just reading some comments there. So Glenda Cuckoo's leading this bit of work from Northumbria University is just wanted to highlight what the phase one element of the actual evaluation is all about. Now obviously Anna's been very busy over there in Cumbria area and they've been doing lots of CGAs for people with moderate to severe frequently. I'm just looking at the question Anna there sorry. Do you mean additional funding in the sense from the sort of the, the ageing well pot of money, Anna, or did you mean yeah, sort of? Yeah, I guess 
I just think we're capturing such a lot of really, really powerful data. I mean, um, before I knew you guys existed, we this was what we set out to do within that for our patient population because we have quite an aging population in Eden, or fifty three and a half thousand patients, twenty six percent over sixty five, which will forecast to grow to forty two percent in the next fifteen years. So for us, for us, the aging well really does matter, and um, we felt that we wanted to be proactive now to identify those patients so that we've got a system processes in place where patients are um, referred into the care coordinators as soon as um, problems start arising. So um, what we're doing at the moment is because of the that daft algorithm that coded everybody with severe and moderate when they're not, we decided actually we'd just go in and undertake CGAs on everybody over the age of 80 and anybody that has particular conditions that might um, put them into a severe or moderate category so that's what we're doing we're going more from one practice to the next and, it, and it's just great isn't it in general practice you don't have chance to just wipe the slate clean and start again but as pcn staff it's been fab because we've just been we've been able to develop this and say right we're going to work with one practice at a time we're going to validate your patients and then if anybody else suddenly appears we need to keep an eye on them as well um, so I guess it's just been a bit of a journey for us and it'd be nice to be able to capture it as part of the work that you're doing, because this to me is really valuable as I think I've been on three meetings now and I find it really helpful. Thanks Anna. I, su I suppose Janet might want to jump in there, but at the very beginning of the sort of the conversation, obviously there's the national ageing well money that comes down across the three priority areas. And then there's the contractual money that comes through for PCNs for certain cohorts of patients where obviously some CGA fits. Um, but from a, an ageing well pot of money, we've always been trying to be very clear that even though there's been a heavy focus on the UCR stuff, we've absolutely said that places need to be spending their money on the care home model and the anticipatory care model. And to be honest, the, the cornerstone to their models and the UCR wants people through crisis is CGA. So yeah. if people cannot spend their money on CGA, then they're doing themselves a disservice for their models of the future, because yeah. that is going to be the cornerstone when we're talking about them sort of three models per se. Granted, anticipatory care might be looking a little bit more down the triangle, slightly more mild, freely may not be that CGA in its purest sense, but the care home model and the UCR model clearly does lend itself to sort of CGA processes and things. So I think every area should do whatever conversation they have to explore CGA as much as they can evaluate it. And we'll do what we can to make sure the ageing well pot gets distributed fairly and shape local conversation. I don't know, Janet, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I completely agree with the conversation. I mean, Anna, I do think it's really important you have a chat to um, colleagues in Cumbria who are distributing the ageing well funding because I think, um, but I noticed in the chat, Glenda said she'd really like to have a chat and I think that possibly is the start of the conversation. You know, have a chat to Glenda, let's look at what we can do, let's look at what we're talking about in terms of funding. And then I think both locally and regionally, we, we'd be keen to look at how we can support you. You know, there there are pots of money. And as Dan says, to me, CGA equals good anticipatory care. And, and you know, linking in the evidence base around CGA and primary care to the tool that I think Caroline's demonstrated today. And I saw a message, I think it was from Vicky, talking about does this interface with system one, you know, how could colleagues working across acute and community, um, you know, they have to be the mainstays of this conversation moving forward. So um, I would suggest a conversation with Glenda in the first time, to, uh, first instance, to find out the art of the possible. Um, and then we'll we'll link up with you to see what avenues are available because it does feel really important. Thank you. And I just want to put a bit of a sort of a wider context to this because obviously we've, we've just focused on CGA but we've also just focused on the digital bit here. And that's what I want to really emphasise here. 
because this is just about something new, digitalizing CGA. Will it work? Won't it work? It may not. But there's obviously a much bigger conversation happening as well around the whole care and support planning process and the personalization agenda and things. That's, that's a much bigger conversation and there's probably multiple conversations happening. The key here is that we join up these conversations with a real focus on sort of the patient person outcomes and what matters and the workforce to support that. So don't feel as though all we think about is CGA. This is just one part of a much bigger conversation that we're trying to have across the system about care and support planning generally. Let you jump in, Anna. Yeah, I I kind of just uh, for me you 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 you're going in in an odd a logical order, and it's now is what comes out of that CGA and all of the um, it's okay to to the tools there it, whether you fill it in paper or the digital and I absolutely understand why you you're exploring this it's it's um, we're in the twenty first century that's what we do. Um, but the power, the power of doing that CGA, the questions, the probing, the, the the things that come out from the patients are so, so important. And we pick up so much more. You know, we ask every patient what matters to you. They're not bothered about their health. They're just bothered about being able to walk down to the corner shop or go and um, eat a chippy on the uh, down at the seafront, you know, and, and that's what's really important. And the thing is there, that's when we bring the social prescriber in who can speak to the third sector or other people and and make that happen and it's it, it's lovely you know but then there's the sad cases where we've got the hoarding in the home we've got real social need and we're really we're, we're all tearing our hair out because there's nothing we can do to support that patient because there's just no care available so the staff are working so hard and I, I think it is for me the care coordinator role has been revolutionary revolutionized primary care from that perspective for us the bottom line though is you can you know there's a very strong argument you can't write the care and support plan unless you've done a good assessment yes because it's what you identify in the assessment that informs the care and support plan and ultimately leads to safe care so that you know when you might need someone to support someone to have their fish and chips on the seafront but equally you know when you need a wider team to investigate actually why can't you walk because you could walk last week and it's yeah. only through the comprehensive assessment that you can start your care and support plan and do you know I, I've been thinking for the last month that I'm speaking very personally here but if I ever find myself living with severe frailty and anyone says what matters to you Leslie I'll say that you comprehensively assess me to identify my needs before you ever start to talk about my care plan because you, you can't the care plan follows the assessment full stop basically and they're great examples that you've given Anna yeah yeah we we've had um it, you're right because it is that MDT approach and actually <laughs> they're probably sick of us in our ICC because we've done so many uh, referrals through to OT <laughs> but that's where it works it's the unmet need isn't it we're now starting to see that and put things in place so thank you I'll shut up now and, and I think what what's important for me because I sometimes hear in various sort of conversations about uh, being done to, being done with, that sort of stuff. I think what the, the crucial thing for me is, is we need to probably move aside from that. What we need to think about is when we're doing this, this is has to be a very personalised approach for the individual. And it's the way we do it and the language we use and how we do it is just as important in tools like this. So it's the language and the personalization agenda and making people feel as though they're in control of the agenda is just as important as all of these tools that we're going to test out and things because that's true personalized care. And I think that's hugely got to be looked at from a workforce perspective and from other angles as well. So even though this felt very clinical and very digital, we are very mindful of the much bigger approach to this, really. Uh, but that's a whole nother conversation happening in multiple arenas and things. So this was just about this digital tool. So I don't want people going away thinking we are just thinking about a tool and we're very clinically focused because we're not. We, we think about the bigger picture, but this was just specifically about that today. So 
I'm just mindful of time when I'm saying that, but I don't know what the time is. It's actually five, five minutes to go. Is there anything anybody wants to add, say, before we wrap up and say goodbye and have the rest of our evenings? I think you've done a brilliant job, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, supported very well by some uh, some excellent colleagues, but it's been a really good meeting. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming along. And obviously we'll have sessions like this every couple of months. You're absolutely more than welcome to join us and we'll do various themes sort of discussions and things. And we will keep everybody up to date with the CGA evaluation and we'll be feeding out through your sort of local Aging Well leads. We'll put information on our website. So do, or just email us if you want to know more and see how we're getting on. Uh, and then we'll keep you posted about next steps into phase two and things. Because before we know it, May will be around or we have to think about that interoperability question and the patient facing question. So thanks for joining us and we'll probably see you next time. Mm -hmm.